Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the prep video for Lesson 7. In Lesson 7, we'll be creating our hunger system. So of course, we'll talk about that here, and we'll talk about macros versus functions. This video and this series have been brought to you by Patreon sponsors like Random Number Generator. That said, let's make a start. So in this tutorial, we'll have an array of functions, variables, and the idea here is that we are going to be consolidating our knowledge around some of the things we've already done. So we're not going to introduce anything really all that new outside of macros. And that is a relatively small thing we're introducing. But we're consolidating what we've done in the previous tutorial. And we're doing so by creating a hunger system. Now that said, one thing to bear in mind is that the hunger system will have a zero to hundred range on the hunger variable where a hundred equals fullness and zero equals an empty stomach. So it's the inverse kind of the meaning, the more hungry or the higher the hunger value, the less hungry the character actually is. The lower the hunger value, the more hungry the character is. So we could think of the uh, hunger variable more as a fullness variable. It just felt really weird calling it that in a tutorial where other people are gonna be looking at it going, why not just call it hunger? But you'll, it is what it is. So we have our current hunger and because it is working on a zero to hundred system, we won't have a max. Those numbers will never change as our min and max values. And we'll be doing other things to affect how that system plays out involving our timer handle. We'll have a hunger reduction, which will actually re increase the amount of hunger somebody has. So reduction in this case means we're reducing the hunger value, meaning we're making their stomach less full. We'll have a hunger timer, and we'll have a variable that will have how often we want this timer to loop. Unlike last time with our timer, we're gonna create a timer handle, which will allow us to pause our timer. And we'll have a variable that says how long we're gonna pause our timer for. We'll have our usual array of functions from two peers to two impeers, and the peers will do check if they're starving. So we'll look for a certain value and we'll return a bool if they're not starving or if they are starving. We'll have our decrease hunger, again, which is actually going to increase the want for food. Again, it's the inverse. Sorry if it's a bit confusing there. We have our get hunger, which is a pure and a getter. And we have our set hunger, which is an impure setter. And as I said, we're consolidating our knowledge. So we'll be implementing this through timers that loop, but we will pause this timer at certain points, like when the character eats, so that after they finish eating, they don't suddenly start getting hungry right away. All right, so let's talk about functions versus macros. We've used functions already. We made a whole bunch of them we haven't really used macros yet. So let's, let's start with a practical example. Let's say we want to manufacture 10 cars. Both a function and a macro can do this for you. If you have the code for it, they'll do it. But they'll do it differently. A macro will create 10 factories. A function will create one factory. A macro, each factory produces one car. So you get your 10 cars. A function, the factory, the one factory, produces 10 cars. So there are other similarities between them, and let's just cover these really quickly so we have the base concept of what a function and a macro is. Both allow you to have an input, a trigger event. Now there's gonna be some caveat differences to this when we talk about macros more in depth. Both are reusable. They can be called in multiple places. Now. In doing so, we actually create that difference that is described above. And I'll talk about that in particular when we get to the part on macros in this little prep video. Both are forms of encapsulation. So we're taking a bunch of code and encapsulating it so we can reuse it elsewhere. Both allow for abstraction. Now I haven't talked about abstraction, but we're actually engaging in abstraction in almost every video. Actually, to be completely fair, Blueprint is abstraction itself. We aren't seeing the underpinning code that it actually is running. Um, funnily enough, though, we are learning the principles of C++ and a lot of the function names that exist in UE4 C++. 
but we are allowed to create abstract ideas now, or sorry, not abstract ideas. We're allowed to abstract information. So abstraction just means obscuring what is actually going on under the hood, so to speak. A good example of this is the AI move to function. We all understand what move to means. It means move this pawn, this character from point A to point B. But what is it really doing? Do we know how the A star algorithm works? Do we know how the line tracing that it does works? So when we have that AI move to function, or node, it's not a function, it's doing a lot of things under the hood. But because we understand the name, we're okay with not knowing, oh yeah, no, it's really doing a whole bunch of things like the A star algorithm or the modified A star algorithm. But now we have something we can have some extra abstraction. We have names like check if hungry, well, or check if starving. We don't need to know what it's actually doing, though we will because we're writing the nodes, but we know what it's doing overall. It's checking if the character's hungry or starving. And they are compiled but run differently, and that's kind of what's going on above. So they both get included um, in, in the compilation process, but how they're compiled is different. So let's take a little look at them more in depth and see the sort of nuances and differences between them more clearly. Let's start with functions. So a function is accessible and modifiable. So children can override, override and modify functions. Other classes, in this case blueprints, can more easily access a function and call the function. And the reason for that is that compile difference. And I'll talk more about that again on the macro slide. And it allows for local variables. Now this isn't to say that macros don't, but I'll have a comment about that on the macro section. So we can see these variables, we can name them. And we'll talk about the scope and the scope of these variables sometime in section two of this tutorial. Now, a function has one exput, uh, executable input and output. It's that white triangular node at the top. We only have one of those for a function or none if we're doing a pure function. We cannot put latent nodes in a function. And that's actually why we're doing macros today. A latent node means there is no timers allowed. You can't have certain AI events that use timers or move events that have timers. Anything that's running on a timer or a timeline, no, not gonna be in a function. It won't allow you to make it into a function. And functions get called, which is why they can be accessed by other BPs. That said, you have to have access to that function to call it, as we talked about in the last video. Macros get copied. This is why a macro doesn't have really any ease of access for, uh, why other blueprints can't have ease of access to macros. There are ways around that with a combination of function and macros, but we'll talk about that later. And then let's talk about our macros. So macros are a bit different. They allow latent nodes. And this is kind of the main reason I will use them um, in this series is, hey, I want sometimes to have a latent node and I don't want it cluttering up my graph. This is a great way to do it. That means we can have timers and certain events that run on timers, as I've already talked about. There are no local variables. All right. Now, somebody just went, I'm wrong. And yeah, I'm not actually feeling speaking tr uh, wholly truthfully here. There are local variables. We just can't see them. We just really can't modify them. Yeah, sure, we can plug it and put in and do some modifications, but it isn't the same sort of visibility of local variables in our functions. This is more of just taking a... Oh, I always get R and L values backwards, but this is more of taking one of those two, the one that isn't set, and changing it and then passing it out the other end. The UE4 documentation calls these anonymous local variables, which kind of makes sense. We can't see them. We can't really tell they're there, but they're there. So for just a, a sort of service level understanding, there are no local variables. For an in-depth understanding, there are local variables. It's just they're much harder to see. And we can't actually name them. We can't create local functions or local variables for them to store the information. And part of that is due to how macros operate. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So 
One other key difference is you can have multiple executable outputs and inputs. This is, again, those little white triangles that usually are at the top. You can have more than one of these in a macro. And in the inventory section of the tutorial, and also I believe the equipment section, we're going to use this to our advantage. Next, and this is the big difference. This is why you can't have local variables. This is why it creates 10 factories. This is why they're not as easily callable. They are copied nodes. So a function is compiled as a function. A macro, when it's compiled, is a copy. What do I mean by this? So when a blueprint is compiled, whenever the macro is called in a blueprint, that macro is copied. The nodes in it are copied and pasted into the graph. Even though we can't see that, that is what's happening behind the scenes. So this is what makes the 10 factories from my earlier example. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the reason why it's not accessible. It's the reason why our local variables work differently because you, you can't really have a local variable when you're copying it into the main sort of function. I realize I'm using main in a different way than it normally would be used here of a class. So that takes us through what we need to know about macros versus functions and what we're doing in this tutorial. This prep video has been brought to you by Patreon sponsors like Quad Menson, Rian, and Haynes. And if you have enjoyed this series, if you're enjoying these prep videos in section one of the survival game, please hit that like button down below. Make sure to hit the subscribe and notify icon so you know when the next set of tutorials is out. And I look forward to seeing you in the main tutorial and hope that you have a wonderful day.